Well, we wish you a good Thursday morning at 8.30 Mountain Time, and welcome to Real Talk. I'm Ryan Jesperson. You know, we're going to start the show with a dedication today, and, and this is the first time we've done this. Now, now the show we're only 14 shows old. This is our 14th episode of Real Talk, but, but this is our first dedication. And this morning, we want to give a shout-out I appreciate Chris Sturwald reaching out to us. You know, every morning when you hear our opener there, uh, whether you're waiting for Real Talk to start and you're hanging out with our YouTube live stream, taking in the the beautiful tunes, the sounds of Ayla Brooke and the Sound Men, that song from their album Desolation Sounds, or whether you're perhaps moved by that song Lift You Up, that you hear, uh, you're going to hear it in a couple of seconds when we officially roll our show opener, and you'll hear it again at the end of the show. Uh, when you see that beautiful time-lapse video uh, right around the Quinnell Bridge. It's Ayla Brooke and the Soundman. And today, Chris Sturwald, the drummer, has reminded us that one of their bandmates, their house band brother, Brent Oliver, is actually going in today for a heart procedure this morning. And Chris says he could use all the positive vibes he can get. He wonders if we can hook a brother up. As a matter of fact, uh, just yesterday, Brent posted from his own account. He says Thursday is my cardio version, uh, a procedure, he says, where they will shock my heart out of failure into a regular rhythm. He's been experiencing heart problems for a while. He says, I've been waiting for this procedure since the middle of September when they first found a clot. But they couldn't perform the procedure safely. He says, now, sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it works and then and then it doesn't after a few months. Brent says, in any case, I'm really hoping it works and sticks. And he says, and I could use any vibes that you have to throw my way. He says, I'm equal parts excited and worried and hopeful for this morning. He says, I'll report back, and as usual, you're all the best. Thank you very much. That's from Brent Oliver. So here's what I'm thinking. We'll dedicate today's broadcast of Real Talk to Brent Oliver, who's having his cardioversion procedure today. But but I have an even better idea. I'm thinking he's easy to find on Twitter, at Brent Oliver, uh, spelled just like it sounds, Brent Oliver, all one word. That's his tag on Twitter. That's his That's his handle. How about if you're watching this morning, if you're watching live right now, why don't you shoot him a tweet? You may not know him. You probably, chances are, don't know him. If you do know him, send him a text. Get him directly in his inbox. But why not take a second and just shoot Brent Oliver good vibes on behalf of the Real Talk family this morning? I love that. You know, we gather every morning thanks to the support of our presenting sponsor, Bitcoin Well. And I've been telling you ever since day one, they've been with us the whole time. This is the, by a mile, the easiest way, the most pain-free way to, first of all, understand cryptocurrency, to understand Bitcoin, and then to buy or sell it. Uh, Bitcoin, well, inching toward trading, publicly trading. This is the thing. People are going, I want to get in on Bitcoin. What about getting in on the company? Anyway, they're not paying me to start talking about this. I'm just excited for them. They're going to be on the market soon, and you can buy into the business. But if you're looking to get into the Bitcoin game, they've got Bitcoin ATMs at most of the Cafe Remedy locations here in Edmonton. They've got Bitcoin ATMs across Canada. You can learn more on their website, but they're proudly headquartered right here in Edmonton. For more information on what they do, check out BitcoinWell.com, which we link to under the sponsors page at RyanJesperson.com. Real Talk starts now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. We've got a busy show this morning. It chilled out a tiny bit. As a matter of fact, just a few moments ago, we heard that one of our guests, unfortunately, is going to have to reschedule. So if you're waiting to hear uh, from Shadow Minister of Finance, Pierre Polyev, this morning, we did announce... Uh, yesterday that he'd be on the show this morning, had it confirmed, but but as is often the case with the movers and shakers in Ottawa and elsewhere, sometimes their schedules change. So we were just uh, recently notified that MP Polyev uh, out of uh, Carleton, the Carleton riding, originally from Calgary, by the way, uh, will have to reschedule uh, his appearance here on Real Talk. So we'll keep you posted when that is going to be. Of course, we were endeavoring to have uh, MP Polyev as the conservative Uh, finance critic essentially they call them the shadow minister of finance to have him uh on the heels 
of Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christia Freeland's appearance with us yesterday afternoon. Wanted to sort of get both sides of the coin represented. That's the whole point of a show like this. So we will endeavor to get MP Polyev on the show as soon as possible. Now, did you happen to catch the Deputy PM with us yesterday afternoon? It was a special broadcast event. You know, typically we sign on at 8.30 Mountain, 10.30 Eastern. We appreciate those of you that tune in from across Canada. We get a real kick uh, out of taking a look at the website and seeing where people are checking in from, not to mention Western Europe, Australia. Uh, I mean, the show is growing day by day, and that's very exciting to us. Uh, now, typically, we'd sign off around approximately, I mean, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, depending on how the show's going. We're supposed to sign off at noon Eastern, at 10 o'clock Mountain Time. Typically, typically, we roll over into the 10 o'clock Mountain Hour and uh, happy to do that. We can do whatever we want. But yesterday... The deputy PM was available right around 2 o'clock Mountain Time, 4 o'clock Eastern. So we seized it. We thought, well, we're not just going to pre-tape this. I'm not going to. I mean, this is what they'll do in TV sometimes. I'm not taking a shot at television producers. I mean, they do a great job most of the time. But what they'll do is they'll have their anchor bring the clothes, the suit and tie, you know, the dress, whatever, for tomorrow, right? And then they'll put it on now. They'll do the interview in the afternoon. They'll pre-tape it. And then in the morning, when they have that other suit on again, they'll say, you know, and now we can check in with, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then they roll the tape. Having been there, it's always nerve wracking. It's always nerve wracking because uh, back in the days of tape, something could happen to the tape. In the days of digital files, there could be a glitch. And what you've just done is, is represent yourself to your audience as being live when really you're not live. And then if there's a glitch and then they find out that you're not live, then the audience starts to wonder, what else are you misrepresenting? What else are you not telling us the truth about? So we made an editorial decision very early with Real Talk. As a matter of fact, from show number one, that we don't pre-tape. We're not gonna, I'm not going to put on today's suit yesterday afternoon, do an interview. We're going to roll it, pretend like it's live, and then you're going to want to comment. You're going to say, I have a great question for your guest. Why is Jesperson not asking my question? Well, it's because we did the interview 14 hours ago. It's not how we're going to roll. Instead, because we're not constrained by standard broadcast time slots, we can go live whenever we want. So that's exactly what we did yesterday. Instead of pre-taping an interview with the deputy PM and then bringing it to you this morning in its entirety, those of you who had a chance to tune in yesterday afternoon were able to watch it in its full form. As a matter of fact, more than 20 minutes, which was pretty wild, way more than we were supposed to have. Worked out great. What we're going to do today, for those of you that didn't see the interview, is bring you some of the highlights. But of course, if you want to see the full 23 minutes, you know where to find it. Anywhere you get your podcasts, it was posted immediately after the interview. And of course, if you're watching live on our YouTube channel right now, you can probably see that video file right below there. You can watch the full 23-minute interview. Now, of course, I started off with what everybody seems to be talking about in, in the context of criticism that the federal government is facing right now. I commented briefly on it a couple of days ago. Some conservative members of parliament, including mine, James Cumming, are describing a liberal plan to seize Canadians' savings accounts as dystopian. In other words, the federal government, having exhausted all options for kickstarting Canada's economy, now have their eyes on your savings accounts. It was all based on an interview that Christia Friedland did with, with BNN. And she talked about the government's plan to try to bring incentives or to try to incentivize people investing in their local economy. So we wanted to get right to it. Question number one, out of the gates, when you're talking about tapping into Canadian savings, or at least that's how it's being represented, what did you mean in plain language? So, Ryan, uh, in plain language, uh, what I was talking about on BNN and what we wrote about uh, in some detail in the fall economic statement is really capitalism and common sense. Uh, we know that small businesses are the heart of our communities and really the heart of Canada's economy. But because of physical distancing, a lot of us haven't been able to patronize our beloved local businesses the way we normally do. 
And a lot of those businesses are facing hard times. What I think we need to do as a country is once the vaccines are here and once we are able to fully reopen the economy is go out and patronize our local businesses. Go out and have breakfast in your favorite coffee shop, have supper in your favorite restaurant. It's going to be time the tourism business, tourism industry has had some hard times. It's going to be time for all of us to go out and travel around our beautiful country. I sure hope I will be able to take my family for a trip to the Rockies next year. Uh, and so what the government wants to do is find ways once we're able to fully and safely reopen the economy, find ways to encourage Canadians to go out and support our local small businesses. What those businesses need, I am supporting them right now uh, from the federal government level to help them get through COVID. But you know, those businesses would prefer not to depend on a federal government check. What those businesses would really like is to have their local customers come in, buy great meals, travel, shop in our local shops. And if we all do that, and if the federal government can find ways to encourage us to do that, that is going to jumpstart the Canadian economy. So that's uh, Christia Freeland yesterday talking to us about what she's alluding to when it comes to Canadian savings and, and kickstarting the Canadian economy and how they believe is the most intuitive way to make that happen. She says it's it's capitalism and common sense. So then there's the question of the Great Reset. And this is what we were particularly interested in talking to Pierre Poliev about today. He's He's been talking about it at length. This, this is the, the World Economic Forum paper that was uh, presented uh, a short time ago. Basically, the idea of, of resetting the global economy, unplugging it and plugging it back in post-pandemic in an intuitive way. Now, depending on how you look at it, it's either intuitive policy or... It's a plot to rapidly accelerate a green economy to the detriment of some of the more traditional economies like, you know, oil and gas, right? So it gets a lot of play talk about this great reset. And, and, and many conservatives have honed in and, and partic- you know, I mean, to be honest, in opposition, I don't blame them for doing this because the prime minister back on, I think it was November 20th, let's say mid to late November, made a comment where he talked about an opportunity to reset Canada's economy. Now, really not that loaded of a word if that policy paper's not already been out there. But because it is, the word reset is one that the opposition, I think, has honed in on, and they're sinking their teeth into it. You know, Some have criticized, and you can read the articles online. There's an editorial in the Toronto Star a couple of days ago that say that, you know, for example, MP Polyev is flirting with with the far right is 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 flirting with the right wing extremists by invoking the idea of this great reset. Well, this is real talk, and so we wanted Christian Freeland to, to boil it down. What are you talking about? What's the prime minister talking about when we talk about resetting the Canadian economy specifically? And Sam, let's get ready to go here. Specifically, what does that mean? I think we need to think about our economy right now in three phases. Um, Stage one is where we are right now. And that is we need to keep on fighting COVID and we need to keep as much of our economy as many of our households intact as we fight COVID. Uh, And that is why the federal government has put in place a really extensive safety net for Canadian businesses, for Canadians. And we're doing that because it's the right thing to do 
to support people who are in difficult economic circumstances through no fault of their own. It's, you know, for a lot of businesses, it's impossible to operate in these lockdown conditions for a lot of people have lost their jobs. But we're also doing it, Ryan, because it is economically the right thing to do. If we can keep as many businesses as possible, as many families as possible, solvent and intact to the end of the pandemic, if we can provide people with a bridge, then once we're able to fully reopen the economy, we will be in a position where the Canadian economy can come roaring back more effectively. So stage one is get through it. Stage two, hope and vaccines and get to a place where we can really reopen. And then once we're in a place where we can fully reopen our economy, I think we all know we're going to have some work to do. We have recovered significantly from the depths of the COVID recession. 80% of jobs now recovered, but 640,000 Canadians still who had a job before COVID started still don't have a job. And so what I announced last Monday is a growth plan that the federal government is preparing to invest between three and 4% of GDP between 70 and $100 billion to get our economy back on track and to get our economy growing. And of course, Ryan, part of that has to be some forward looking investments. We need to do things like invest in rural broadband across the country. We've all seen how important the digital economy is. I think we've just seen Ottawa broadband is not always adequate either just now. So, you know, we need to move forward into, you know, the not the economy of yesterday, but the economy of today and tomorrow. So things like rural broadband, digital economy more generally. And yes, Ryan, we do need to invest in the green and clean economy. That is where the world is going. I think the Alberta oil and gas sector has heard from global investors that that is where the energy sector needs to go to. And I am so proud of my Alberta roots. Uh, I realize I'm an MP for downtown Toronto, but I still consider myself in my heart an Alberta girl. And I am very excited about working with Alberta businesses with the Alberta oil and gas sector to together be part of that transition to a clean green economy. Lots of oil and gas companies have made net zero by 2050 commitments. And I think those are going to help us all get there. That's Christian Freeland in conversation with us yesterday afternoon. If you didn't see it live and you're wondering, what's she talking about? We've just seen that Ottawa broadband uh, sometimes isn't uh, sufficient or sometimes needs improvement. We did lose our, our feed with her uh, right after the first question. And uh, and of course, you know, uh, we're lucky to have uh, co-pilot Sam G. Brooks, the senior producer of this show, troubleshooting. He was doing an amazing job with the uh, DPMO uh, the deputy prime minister's office. With it. It, it just I don't it feel a little bit cool when you say hey, you're on the line with the DPMO. It, yeah, it does. It'll feel um, a little cooler to say PMO. It, w- it will, and we're working on that. Uh, we have been working on it's that. It's imminent. <laughs> it's imminent. But you were, it, on it's, with, you were on with the DPMO, and, and, and you got the feedback quickly. Uh, from my end, it's kind of funny because you feel like, uh, I mean, I don't know what it felt like to be a pilot, uh, what it would feel like to be a pilot. But, but I think back into the, the, the early days, like the WAP May days, uh, w- when they would just fly into the clouds and just sort of wonder, how long is the cloud cover going to last? What's it going to look like? And hopefully we don't hit a mountain peak. But it worked out all right. Sam troubleshot and, uh, and, and the breakdown, the connection uh, breakdown was on their end. They got us back. We got them back, however you want to put it. And the interview continued. I have to say, the best part about that was I, th- I think that Minister Freeland felt a little bad about it. And so she actually on the fly extended the interview by about 10 minutes. Yeah, we got, we got, we got a 10 minute extension and then a five minute extension. Like <laughs> yeah, it was, was and great. that does not happen with government. Officials. Felt- like you have to remember, because like I, I used to be photographer, videographer. So like my experience working with like high profile elected officials is point the camera here and shut up. 
That that's always been my job. <laughs> so uh, this was new for me, and and uh, DPMO Freeland's staff were fantastic yeah, to work with. They were great. So so we get her back, and the interview continues. And uh, and I wanted to. Do we have uh, Brad Fair on the line? So uh, we're working. Okay, on Okay, we're it. working on it. So we yeah, do, we, we, we have, we've been having some connection issues. Well, well, that's totally fine because I can just keep going on this, which I'm happy to do. So we so we keep talking to 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 Freeland, and, and she touches on her Alberta roots there. Right. And she, and she she says, I mean, and I, I would I would agree with her on this front that, uh, it, it, you know, there's an impetus on on not just federal governments, provincial governments, municipal governments, for that matter. And and executive leaderships in private and publicly traded corporations, for that matter, to look toward and brace for and prepare for and ideally, uh, you know, gear up for a so-called clean and green economy. That's not a bad thing. That's not inherently bad. Uh, oil companies, big energy companies, first of all, they're changing their names uh, to reflect the word energy as opposed to oil. I mean, you, you've even seen that trend, uh, and this is not demonizing oil. This is, I know you got to be so careful these days what you say, you know, for fear of being characterized as anti-Alberta or anti-Western Canada. You know, it's a bunch of malarkey, isn't it? Uh, you know, you're you're suggesting that a, that a corporation or that a government should prepare itself for for economic realities, for market realities, for environmental realities. That is a thing. I mean, you know, I mean, I know this sounds ridiculous to say, but if your family was a was a big shareholder 150 years ago in you know whale blubber lamps used as streetlights in the city of London, you may have been impressed if your corporate leadership braced for this new invention that a guy Thomas Edison was working on out of the United States. You know, you, you may have been thrilled when your family business transitioned to include things like power and light bulbs as opposed to wicks and whale fat. You wouldn't have been upset about that. So it makes sense that the federal government's looking at that. Now the question is, what does it mean for the industries right now that remain huge contributors uh, to Canada's GDP, to Canada's employment, uh, and in particular to the Western provinces, the oil and gas sector, right? So we asked Deputy PM Freeland about that. When she references her Alberta roots, you know, growing up in Alberta, attending high school at, at Old Scona in Edmonton, you know, how does that inform her policy? And I'm going to bring you her answer in just a second. But first, we wanted to recognize a couple of the partners that keep us on the air each and every morning. Now, as I'm talking to you, as Sam is working behind the scenes to get our next guest locked and loaded, we're also keeping an eye on our hashtag, RealTalkRJ. You know, Jeff listens in from Calgary every morning, and he, he reached out a couple of days ago, and he said, why can't we text into the show? I miss texting into the show. And I said, Jeff, you know, there's this platform called Twitter, and if you get on it, and if you start using the hashtag RealTalkRJ, you can talk directly to the show, and that's how we know how you feel about our content. Well, that hashtag is powered by the team at Park Power, and we're thrilled to have them on board as a builder here on Real Talk. Park Power is in the internet game. They're in the natural gas game. They're in the electricity game. They're offering a different option than the large, traditional incumbent utility companies. You know, the big dogs. Well, this is a locally owned company employing local people in their call centers, their customer service centers, and since 2013, they've been profit sharing with local charities. How cool is that? You can sign up today or learn more at parkpower.ca or find them across social media. Their social media is strong for a utility company. I've never seen anything like it. Kudos to Park Power. There's also the team at Alta Moving and Storage. Alta Storage is your one-stop shop for these pod-style containers. You know, you see them. Maybe you've seen your neighbors preparing to move. They have the pod-style container dropped off in front of their house. and You go, gosh, that would make everything so much easier. Maybe even especially if you hired out a few workers to maybe fill it and unload it for you. Alta Storage and Moving can, well, they can coordinate all of that for you. Plus, they have those eco-friendly frog boxes that you can use. If you're looking for self-storage, they've got you covered there, too. And they're a proudly local company. Again, are you, are you picking up on a theme here? You can learn more about what they do by checking out the sponsors link at ryanjesperson.com if you're already on our website or check out altastorage.ca. If you'd rather talk to a human being, as mentioned, they're local, 780-993-ALTA. Our thanks to our sponsors. So we're talking to the Deputy Prime Minister yesterday and, 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 and we ask her, you know, so you are an Alberta girl. Proudly so, she says in that interview. You heard the clip if you were just watching a few minutes ago. I said, how does 
you know, how do your Alberta roots influence your policy when you see the the pandemic and its economic impact? And then you see the global energy market and what's happening there and the economic impact of oil's slowdown on Alberta, the Saskatchewan and, and ultimately Ottawa's coffers. How does your how do your Alberta roots factor into all of this? And, and, and here's what Christian Freeland had to say. It resonates with me very profoundly, Brian. Uh, I love Alberta. Uh, I know how entrepreneurial, how smart, how vibrant Albertans are. And I know that for the Canadian economy to prosper, we need a prosperous Alberta. And I am 100% committed to working with the amazing people in Alberta to be sure that that's what we build together. That's Christia Freeland yesterday in conversation uh, with us. And again, you can watch the full interview. It's about 23 minutes or so uh, by checking out our YouTube channel. That's what I'm looking at right now. Uh, and you can also, of course, find it anywhere you download your podcast. And uh, we've just heard from the Podboard 100, by the way. I wanted to let you know that they said, uh, <laughs> this is great, the work that they're doing. We checked in with them. They're actually based out of Sweden. This is unrelated to anything to do with Christia Freeland. But they're based out of Sweden. And... Uh, what am I hearing? I'm hearing some uh, interview audio. It doesn't matter. Sam's Sam is working furiously behind the scenes. Uh, we are right now the duck on the water. I am calm, cool, and collected above water, but the feet are furiously moving below the surface. We're going to get our first guest locked and loaded hopefully soon enough. Uh, but the pod board team tells us out of Sweden that we're on track. They say if our downloads keep tracking uh, like they are right now, if our downloads keep tracking like they have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of this week, we're on track. We're on track to take back number one spot in Canada, which is absolutely awesome. And we thank uh, we thank uh, all of you that are making sure that the Real Talk podcast is ranked among the most listened to in Canada. We really appreciate that. Unfortunately, it looks as though and this the, hey, this is what happens when you do live shows like this. We had four guests planned. It appears as though we've now lost fifty percent of our lineup this morning. Brad Fair was going to join us. He's a brain injury survivor, and yesterday you. Made may have seen online uh, he was using a super cool setup and we were going to talk to him about that perhaps we'll figure it out some other show but he had reached out to us early yesterday morning uh, in other words the message was already waiting for us when we went on air it was already there and, and Brad said today I'm going to cycle I think he said 100 kilometers out of the gates and on one of these you know his bike is mounted in his house right the 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 rear wheel lifted off, and, and you can tell I don't do this at home, or I'd probably know the proper terminology. But he was using a software program that had a big screen in front of him, and it looked as though he was touring through the mountains. It's very cool software. He says, I'm doing this. He says, I'm going to feel the burn here. As one who has, has tapped into Alberta's health resources as a, as a head injury survivor, Brad said, I'm going to feel the burn today, and I'm going to ride in honor of Alberta's health care workers, of Canadian frontline health care workers. Well, midway through the morning, this guy's going to ride 100 kilometers. He says, ah, eh. he says, we're going to make it 200. So in about five and a half hours, while he was, he was sending us updates from his phone, it was amazing yesterday on Twitter, he's got his iPad here uh, just to his right. He's, he's like on his racing bike, and he's got his iPad streaming real talk. He's watching the show, and then in front of him, he's got his cycling simulator. The guy bangs out in, I think, five hours, 36 minutes, 200 kilometers on his road bike. In honor of, in particular, Dr. Darren Markland, one of our first guests ever here on this broadcast, and frontline healthcare workers. How incredible is that? So we hope to get Brad Fair's story at some point. Uh, for whatever reason, the connection didn't work out today. And if you're just tuning in and you're hoping to hear from Pierre Poliev, he was scheduled to join us at 10 o'clock Mountain, noon Eastern. Something's come up. Uh, with the MP's schedule, and they've asked if they can reschedule as well. It just means more talk time for us, which is great, and I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, we're going to get to the news in just a moment. Then we're going to check in with Michelle. Uh, uh, no, that'll be later on. Never mind. That's going to be later on in the show. Natasha Kornack's going to join us coming up right after 9 o'clock. She's a former United Conservative Party staffer, uh, a young conservative that's, that's now pursuing a bit of a different avenue in life. And we're really excited to have her as a member of our viewing and listening audience. She reached out and said, I thought it might be worthwhile to have a conversation about young people and COVID-19 protocols. And I thought that would be 
very, very interesting because there are a lot of angles on these protocols, right? A prominent Edmonton newspaper columnist this morning writing as the rural Albertans, for example, have a choice on whether or not they fall in line with the new laws. So different demographic groups, whether it's geographical, rural versus urban, or whether it's age, perhaps seniors, the elderly, young people, I think we can probably read in and either anecdotally observe or maybe even simply speculate on what those demographic impacts will have on compliance. We'll get into that with Natasha Cornack coming up in just a moment. First, want to just say a huge shout out to the team at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. We're grateful to have them continuing to keep our rubber on the road every weekday morning starting at 830 Mountain Time. You know, Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge are your two go-to stores in Alberta. They know you have choices where you're going to buy your new vehicle, where you're going to lease, or where you're going to get it serviced. Well, they're Alberta's top Jeep dealers. And with this Jeep lineup looking absolutely unbelievable for 2021, that's your go-to if you want the best service and, of course, the most customer-focused sales in the province. Go talk to Scott and his team at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. Let's take a look at what's making news on this Thursday morning. Well, we heard yesterday the news broke as we were on the air, Health Canada approving that uh, Pfizer vaccine. Uh, this is the Pfizer and Bio, uh, BioNTech uh, vaccine that uh, they're hoping uh, will be the answer to this entire thing as we endeavor to. I mean, are you looking like I am months ahead and saying, when can we put this behind us? When can I get back to tossing T-shirts off Section 227 at Rogers Place? Yeah, me too. The first vaccines are set to roll out. The provincial government here in Alberta confirming next week, and they'll be going to uh, the most vulnerable, as well as those working in acute care centers, doctors and nurses. Meantime, Cole Pino, who's the president of Pfizer Canada, says the company will start shipping doses of its COVID-19 vaccine tomorrow to arrive in Canada a few days later. Now, you may be paying attention to what's going on stateside, right, where uh, American President Donald Trump signed an executive order to restrict exports of vaccines from the United States. What does that mean for Canada? Nothing, according to Pino of Pfizer Canada, says we're shipping the product, the vaccine from Belgium, and so we feel confident we can provide it in December to Canadians. At the Alberta Legislature last night, action until about 3 o'clock in the morning as the legislature passed four bills in less than 24 hours before concluding its fall sitting uh, in the early hours. That was the early hours of Wednesday. Earlier this week, the United Conservative government, using its majority uh, to limit the amount of time spent debating legislation, it was able to pass its uh, contentious Bill 47. Everybody's talking about that, making changes to workplace safety rules. The NDP sure doesn't like that one. And Bill 46, which amends the Health Information Act. That's the one that's drawn criticism from the Privacy Commissioner. This was that weird one, and, and it's not just the United Conservatives. There's an interesting history to this legislation that allows a health minister to access an individual's, your private health records if they believe it to be in the public interest am i the only one seeing 150 red flags around me that just feels weird doesn't it more on that uh, as we continue to pay attention to the stories that matter most you know our next guest this is uh i mean this is her wheelhouse uh, natasha kornak has has been uh, a united uh, conservative uh, staffer and before that certainly an engaged young politico you you may have read her blog before you may follow her on twitter at natasha underscore cornack she gives a rip about her community and she's not afraid to put in the time uh, to better her community she makes her real talk debut this morning natasha welcome to the show and thanks for being here with us Good morning, Ryan. Thanks for having me. I uh, I noticed something, and I want to address it uh, right off the hop here. If you were able to join us in studio, uh, we might have champagne and cupcakes because if the information in front of me is correct, I believe today to be your birthday. Yep, it it, it is. Uh... 24 today. <laughs> well, a very happy birthday to you. Uh, 24 years into it, student uh, down at the University of Calgary, as mentioned, formerly a staffer at the Alberta Legislature. What you you were? I mean, I think I've been following you now for for probably three or four years. Uh, to see somebody so engaged 
in the political process and, and making the community contributions like you do. Uh, what was it that planted the seed for your political interest early? I mean, it, it strikes me as though uh, even in your teenage years, this was on your radar. Yeah, I was always one of those people who, um, you know, I, I just kind of had a political family. <laughs> my, my dad is very uh, politically minded and uh, we would always talk about these sorts of things. Um, and when I was 18, I was so excited to vote. I turned 18 when I was in grade 12. A lot of people were like, yeah, I can go to bars. And I was like, I get to vote. Um, for reference, that was the 2015 election. Uh, and I had no idea where I really stood in terms of candidates. My, my MLA was Bruce McAllister, who had crossed from the Wild Rose, the PCs. Um, and I had all these questions, and I actually put them to all the MLAs, and then I ended up deciding to bring them out to my high school. I went to Springbank Community High School, shout out to those guys there. Um, and uh, we had all of them out to our, out to our uh, high school to do an all candidates forum and uh, it was wonderful. And then we did a mock election after that, which was super cool. And I ended up falling, you know, kind of politically speaking in love with one of the candidates. And uh, that was Leela Ahir, who has been a really good mentor and friend to me. And that kind of, uh, spiraled my uh, way into um, politics and I guess kind of brought me into some of those conservative circles. I can talk about that a bit more later if you want, if you're interested. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it happened. Uh, I'm really grateful for the experience and yeah, it's yeah. been kind of something that I was interested in. Well, I, I want to talk about all of it. Uh, because the, the model of this show and, and really what we're pursuing is, is frank conversations. Uh, sometimes, Natasha, it'll be with uh, party leaders and, uh, uh, you know, I mean, political leaders at the, at the top of the totem pole, so to speak. A lot of times it'll, it'll be with the, the very prominent, uh, you know, executive leaders of big corporations. But, but most often I find that the most powerful interviews and the most meaningful conversations are with everyday people. Uh, they're with people that are telling their stories. We had a principal from from Delburn School, just east of Red Deer, the other day, uh, taking us inside a school and, and giving us a really clear idea of the challenges that educators are facing as a result of this pandemic. There's more value in my mind to that conversation than a conversation with some talking head uh, from government. I think sometimes government feels two arms length away uh, from most people for it to feel relevant there now, now you can be involved in the political process and then you can attempt to make it your career which is which is what you were on the path to do uh handling caucus comms with the united conservatives but you left uh relatively early in that career now not to say you couldn't return to the political arena to be sure but what was that experience like and, and what prompted you walking away from the alberta legislature so there were a number of things uh number one i'm a calgary girl born and raised and no shade to my edmonton Friends uh, who were there, I just, I really missed home. I had been away at school in Ontario. I, I did my undergrad at Queens. So I had been in Ontario for four years and I just, I really just never got to really come home and, and you know, reconnect with my Calgary friends and family. So I really did miss them. Um, you know, I, so I actually started off as a press secretary uh, in the Ministry of Community and Social Services. And I was fresh out of my undergrad. Like, right out of the gates. I finished in uh, 2019 and I, uh, I was hired in May of 2019 and I was 22. Um, and it was a great experience. I really liked it. Uh, quickly learned that I was just better suited to broader caucus comms. And so I was shuffled to, to caucus. I was shuffled <laughs> as though I have some sort of importance. Uh, I was moved to caucus comms and I have no qualms about it, whatever it was. It was a, it was a, the right decision um, on the part of their uh, their HR people. Um, you know, I'm I'm sorry, but it's boiling. I'm going to take this off. It, it's 2020. <laughs> women's shoulders should not be an issue. Um, so, <laughs> um, uh, it's boiling in this room. But yeah, you know, so I was in uh, I was in caucus comms and I loved it. It was awesome. I got to do a lot of speech writing and stuff like that. Um, it's something that I really enjoyed doing and and you know working with people there. But I also realized that I really have a policy brain um, and I had previously come into politics doing advocacy work on, on sexual violence um, and, and things like that. And, you know, as a young woman, it's already kind of hard to be taken seriously when you don't have as much professional experience, you know, you don't have as much life experience. 
Um, and so I found that there were just, you know, it was kind of hard for me to really speak up and, and have my, my say in policy in the way that I wanted to um, when you're in a comms capacity. So I had kind of known that I wanted to apply to graduate school at the uh, U of C MPP program. So I decided to do that. And, um, and then there were also some personal factors and my, um, my grandparents here that I, I live with here in Northwest Calgary, they, uh, my grandfather has dementia and I could just see it was just getting progressively worse and worse. And no one put this on me, but I just, I could see that they, they needed the extra help. And I'm very close with my grandmother here too. I love her to bits and pieces. So I decided to move in here and um, I moved back, got a job in the private sector for a few months before realizing that I just, I couldn't do the caregiving plus the, uh, plus the grad school on top of it. So I've taken a leave for that. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell what it was. Uh, it was a combination of personal factors, as well as the fact that, you know, it just wasn't necessarily the right, the right fit for where I saw me wanting to make an impact. First, on a personal note, you will never regret the time that you're investing with your grandparents now. Uh, that's, I, I just think, I mean, I would imagine that you're already uh, every single day having your bucket filled uh, by time with them, but that's something that for the rest of your life, you're absolutely going to cherish yeah, I've, I've been very, like, they helped raise me in a lot of ways. The house that I'm sitting in right now, um, they've lived in since 1953, like, and they are really, they're staples in their community, in their church, in, you know, they, they spent their lives square dancing. They were actually in the Olympic opening ceremonies, and I thought about bringing up, um, <laughs> some, I thought about bringing up my grandma's uh, square dance costume that she had when she was in that Olympic opening ceremonies, Um it's, you know, they have so many stories and things to tell. And, you know, so they're Saskatchewan born and raised and, you know, they brought a lot of those humble roots here and, you know, they were teachers and I, I can talk more about, you know, my, my family is just very service oriented. Um, you know, my aunt's a teacher, my other aunt's an ICU nurse. Um, and I've just got, you know, and they, they started a small business in the garage. It's right outside my window there. Um, a little print shop that they ran outside of their garage uh, starting in 1970. And it's still operating today. Um, is it so still operating? Just, is it still, lot. it's not still operating out of the garage. No, it's now in Northeast Calgary. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, I'm going to plug them. It's Brentwood printing. They print anything. If you need uh, if you need things delivered in printing in Calgary or they deliver to Edmonton anywhere, like it's, they're, they're great. Um, you, so Brentwood you know what? Printing. I'm uh, i I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm surprised that, that more people don't do what you just did, which is take advantage of this platform to tell people about businesses they care about. So absolutely, Brentwood Printing, there you go. I mean, we, we've got a community here of people that can show their support to other Albertans that are doing great work. Natasha Kornack uh, is our guest. I love this. Uh, of those that are watching us live streaming on YouTube right now, uh, Lila says, I was 22 when I was hired to be a research assistant for my member of parliament uh, in the House of Commons office. Uh, she says, I was so young. Uh, Heidi is listening in and says, as a nonpartisan, but a current NDP supporter, she says, I absolutely love Leela Ahir. Says, I just think she could do so much better than this current government caucus, but what do you do? Leela Ahir has a lot of supporters, I, I would say, or people that are at least intrigued by her political potential outside of the party that she represents. Uh, I just know that anecdotally, if you're talking to people about Alberta politics, a lot of people that may not have voted United Conservative will still have a lot of respect for Leela Ahir. Now, other people will suggest that she could do a lot more with her position, but of course, there are the delicate natures of, of party politics that people have to adhere to. What did you learn from here, her? What did you observe from her, specifically in the context, as you alluded to, of being a young woman uh, endeavoring to expand her experience in the political arena? Leela has been like a mom to me. And I mean that in the fullest possible sense. Um, and I'm very privileged. And I know like a lot of people can't say that their, their MLA has been like a mom to them <laughs> and have those close personal relationships. Um, it's, you know, I met Leela during the 2015 um, race. And basically what happened was I reached out to all these different candidates saying, you know, here are my questions here. Here's all these different things. And I was like, oh, she's running wild roads. Aren't the wild roads like 
anti-gay and aren't they like the lake of fire people? I was, you know, I, I was 18 and seeing a lot of these, you know, I was more progressive. I still, I still identify kind of more in that, uh, you know, more progressive vein of, of politics. Um, but I, I, I had all these preconceived notions of what she was going to be like, and she was anything but that. Um, so I, uh, I, I kind of, you know, had, I had all these questions for her and, and I, we had this long conversation over the phone. Um, and one of her answers to a question I had about, you know, healthcare spending, she said, you know what, I, I don't know the answer to that. And I'll have to get back to you. Do you know how refreshing it is mm. to have a politician tell you they don't know, like rather than come up with something um, off the cuff and spin and rather than just saying like, hey, I, I don't know that information and that's a perfectly valid question, I'm gonna get back to you. Um, or I don't have access to that information because it's you know department information, I'm not elected yet and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that to me spoke to her, her humility and just genuine nature um, and it kind of blew me away. Um, so that's kind of, you know, so that was one thing I learned a lot from her was about that, that humility and kindness she shows kindness to every single person that she interacts with. Um, and that's something that I kind of strive to do myself. And I know that there have been times in my life uh, where I may have, you know, maybe not been super nice or, or um, I may have been a little more aggressive than I should have been. Um, and if anyone is out there and I've offended you on social media or in real life, I am genuinely sorry. I'm going to take this opportunity to apologize for that. Well, you know, hang on, I, a, hang on a second. Reasons, hang on but, a second. And, yeah. and I, I want to I want to keep it classy, Natasha. So so I don't want to interfere with a blanket apology uh, if you feel as though one is appropriate. However, as someone uh, yourself who has been involved in the political process, who has gained a paycheck from work at the Alberta legislature, I would imagine you've had your fair share of nastiness slung your way. And maybe sometimes we can get down into the muck and mire and what do they say? Never wrestle with pigs because they love it. And all you'll do is get covered in slop or whatever it is. Uh, I understand that. But sometimes I think, you know, I mean, I've just blocked someone this morning uh, and I'm, and I will not apologize for it. I'm happy to do it. Um, It's too long of a story to get into right now. Maybe I'll tell the story later in the show as to why this person earned a block. Um, But I don't apologize for that kind of stuff. And I think what, what I've realized is that having been subjected to, to mountains of nastiness and negativity on an ongoing basis. I mean, for six years, I hosted a radio show where I had a a 24-inch monitor in front of me that did nothing but spew insults at me for three hours a day. It does something to your psyche. It, It tightly winds you up. It gets you to a point where you could lash out at somebody that may not actually even really deserve it. What they have said may not have been that bad, but you're so high strung and, and so people would say, oh, you're triggered or you're a snowflake, but they don't understand what it's like to have a screen in front of you telling you how shitty you are all the time. And I do not apologize for some circumstances where I've simply said, I don't care what you have to say anymore. I'm muting or blocking you. I'm taking you out of my stratosphere so I can continue to, to have some semblance of a normal day. How did you deal with that? And if I can ask, as a woman and a young woman, in politics, how did you deal with that? Or how do you deal with that? Ooh. So I think one of the, you know, I haven't gotten it nearly as bad as some of my colleagues, my colleagues who are, you know, in more of the public view, um, as well as some of pe- the people I know who are elected. Um, I go through some of the comments of, you know, MLAs. Uh, I remember I kind of Back when Shannon Phillips was a minister of environment, I remember seeing people calling her names and things like that. And I kind of called them out. Uh, And I I might've had disagreements with um, then minister Phillips about policy. um, And I, you know, at the end of the day, she's she's someone who deserves respect. Um, She's worked her way into that position and she's duly elected. And even if you're not elected, I feel like we just owe it to each other to have that sense of uh, kindness and camaraderie with each other. Um, You know, I was raised in in this 
with my grandparents' influence. And if you hear any background noise, I'm sorry, my my grandpa's caregiver just got here. God That's bless great. those. That's great. Workers. This is this is real um, life. This is real life. It is real life. It's real life. <laughs> I have sweatpants on under here. <laughs> this is this is real life. Um, uh, so I mean, you know, in terms of how I've dealt with it. I, I kind of maybe ch- I've engaged some people maybe more than I should have. Um, and in some cases I've had people who have realized, Oh wait, I was wrong. And I'd like to apologize. I myself, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of those people who will go after anyone who like crosses people who are near and dear to my heart. So, you know, when I was working on a certain campaign, I was, and I slung mud at one of the, one of the, uh, one of her opponents back in when I was working on a municipal campaign in ways that I really shouldn't have. Um, and it was really high strung and uh because a lot of the criticism coming towards her was racialized and gendered in nature and uh, but but that that candidate running against her was the primary threat and i and i didn't and i i slung mud that i shouldn't have and i actually ran into him in person um jeff davidson who's a lovely lovely human and i was like i am so sorry i was such an ass um i was like 19 and i you know had this you know and that's not an excuse for, for that but i've kind of grown up and realized, um, you know, how do I want to interact? And I don't like getting it. I, I didn't like, I didn't like getting, being on the receiving end. And it wasn't a good use of my energy. I realized that, yeah, it is like, it is a really big mental stressor um, to have people calling you names. I had a guy tell me to set myself on fire and the CBC had him on. Um, I ended up sending an email to their ombuds, uh, ombudsman one of my favorite words to say. Who's the um, guy? Who's the, the thing, guy? Hey, like, if 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 this if the CBC had him on, he's public enough of a figure that I think you can recognize him. Someone told you to light yourself on fire, and then found, and then what? They were brought on as a political commentator. Who are we talking about? Uh, yeah, he he's uh he. I don't really know what really triggered it. Um, I have all this. I I, I document things that are really really bad. Yeah. Um just for my own protection if I ever needed to do something about it. Uh, Cause he was also a PhD student at Queens, but I came to, and I was still in my undergrad there. And I was kind of a little concerned, like Jeez. I ended up sending it to their graduate. You know, I was like, just, just so you know, like I just want to flag this in case, you know, this ever comes up again that, you know, this might be a pattern of behavior. Yeah. Um, and he was also on like, uh, like the IRPP's policy options podcast. And it kind of just, it, I don't know, like it, when they say triggered, I know it's kind of a buzzword, but it kind of did like, it just made me feel like it really kicked up my anxiety. Um, that was the only, like I ended, I, I texted a couple of people that I knew who worked in politics. I was like, what do I do about this? Like, is this, is this actually a concern that I need to be worried about like safety wise or what do you do in these situations that have never happened to me before? They're like, you know, block, report, keep those things there. Um, you know, I had, I had a situation where a sitting MLA went after me when I endorsed, um, the, the, um, you know, the United conservative movement, like the merging of the two right-wing parties. Um, and they tried to undermine my advocacy on, on sexual violence because of that. And I, and I ended up having like a slew of trolls come after me. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't a great experience. Uh, and I wish that that person would have just maybe DM'd and said, hey, like, I have a problem with what you're saying here, and I'd like to air my grievances. And I'm someone who will hear you out, and I'll, I have this kind of curse of being, I don't like to, I'm not trying to say, like, tooting my own horn, but I'm kind of one of those people who's, like, very empathetic in a way, and we're all, like, it's kind of a curse because <laughs> I can always be the devil's advocate. Well, let me ask you this, um, Natasha, because we're our our uh, real talk roundtable tomorrow from nine to ten is is going to be all about uh, meeting in the middle, and it's going to and it's going to be all about whether or not people on the left wing or the right wing or or, or people of faith and and agnostic and athe- you know atheists uh, or or whatever pick your team, uh, pick your priority, whether or not we can still as human beings respectfully. Uh, and with in, in meaningful fashion, communicate with one another. And I'm really excited about our panelists that are coming up tomorrow from from nine to ten. Did you? Uh, I mean, it's kind of a loaded question here, but but did you did you did you leave jaded or did you lose faith in the process or did that? I mean, you've explained to us why you left the legislature and and, and a huge part of it is family and a huge part, there are other factors at play. But but did did that influence you? And and, and you know, I've talked to so many 
uh, women that are doing amazing things to, to attract more women to politics. And we need more women. We need more visible minorities. Uh, we need more religious minorities. We need our, our, our political landscape to reflect our everyday landscape. Did, did all of this that you're describing chase you away from that or influence you away from it in a way? So I found the culture in the legislature to be highly, highly toxic. Um, I did do an internship where I worked um, for the, I did like the conservative party internship uh, in Ottawa uh, in 2018. I worked for Shannon Stubbs, who is phenomenal, like such a firecracker. I had the most amazing experience working for her, but the camaraderie amongst staff and amongst the MPs there for as hyper-partisan as it seems, there's actually, like they get along really well. I, you know, I, I would bump into MPs or, or whoever at, you know, um, I, the, the grocery store and, you know, hi, you know, so-and-so and everyone was just so kind. And, you know, I, I remember when I went to the legislature, um, there were just a few instances where, you know, uh, there's some people who are just, who are just so lovely and kind. Janice Irwin is one of them. And I've, I've struck up kind of a, a nice relationship with her. She's just a ray of sunshine and very, very kind. Um, but there have been some instances where I've seen, uh, you know, I, I introduced myself to an MLA who shall remain nameless in an elevator. I complimented their outfit because they have amazing style. And then they were like, oh, where do you work? And I was like, oh, I'm in the UCP caucus. And immediately it was just like stone cold. And I was like, okay, I guess there, there goes that. Like I was trying to be nice and have a strike up a conversation. And, and it, it was just, but it's also on the other side too. Like there is just this palpable animosity. Like you feel, you physically feel the tension. Um, I've never felt anything it, like it from, from my end. Uh, I mean, I, back in the day, you know, you know who like the two most famous uh, through the two thousands, you know, the, 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 the most famous drinking buddies uh, were Brian Mason and Thomas Lukaszek, right. Of, of the progressive yeah, conservatives and, and Brian Mason, NDP leader, Thomas Lukaszek, deputy premier. They used to go for beers all the time and they still have a great friendship. They still connect in the summers and drink wine together. Those guys politically are not in, in the, uh, they're not on the same page on a lot of things, but they get along well. I mean, I, I think of an interview, one of my favorite interviews I've ever done uh, was leading up to the 2015 provincial election. Jim Prentice joined me for a one-on-one -on -one sit down and it was, it was a, it, it, I mean, I think it was a remarkable interview. Um, quite frankly, if I can say it, it kind of put me on the map a little bit. I mean, uh, Gary Mason wrote about it in the Globe and Mail. Uh, I mean, it was a big interview, and 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 I was tough on Prentice, it, a, a, as you would expect from someone from an interviewer that's worth their salt. I don't think anybody wants to listen to bullshit platitude interviews. I mean, some people do, uh, but that's not the type of interview we do. You know what we went to commercial break? It was tense. Like Prentice was rolling up his sleeves during the interview. He kind of had this thing going on with me. You know what we talked about in the commercial break? We talked about classic cars. We talked about our families. We talked about normal things. And then I said, with about 10 seconds left to go, we're coming back from commercial. I said, you ready to get back into this? He goes, all right, let's go. Smile on his face. The light goes on. Face, the smile disappears, and here we go right back into it. Jim Prentice was one of the good ones, and that's exactly what it's all about. That's not the way it is right now, Natasha. I mean, right now, the, the, the provincial government, and you're, and you're providing testimony of your personal experience from some of the treatment you've received from, from people on the left or people in opposition. Let me tell you, as a talk host right now, the, the, the attempted intimidation uh, from the government right now is like nothing I have ever seen. I mean, my reporting career has co has covered the tenure of six Alberta premiers. There is nothing uh, prior to Premier Kenny uh, that any journalist has seen that even resembles this, even remotely close. Ralph Klein used to pick his spots. He was an intimidating guy to interview, and it was and it was always a real thrill to talk to Ralph. He was my mayor when I was a young kid in Calgary. But Ralph Klein, he'd be tough on you, and he'd tell you if he thought your questions were BS, and he'd put you right up against a wall. He'd back you up against a wall, metaphorically speaking, and he was really good at it. But he'd never stonewall you and freeze you out and, 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 and insist that his caucus not speak to you and try to bury your career. Uh, that was never, that, that, that's something new. That's a new tone at the Alberta legislature. And I think that everybody should be concerned about that. Okay. Um, no, I, not that I don't disagree with you. There's a lot to unpack there. There was, there was no, um, there, I didn't put a question in front of you. I, I, that was just a statement on, on my part. But I'm just saying, you talk about the tone 
at the Alberta legislature. It is very troubling right now. I mean, I, I mean, at my former radio station, my understanding is I didn't hear the interview. Uh, but but yesterday, my understanding is that Shea Ganim, uh, the morning host on that radio station, uh, pointed out to Premier Kenny, for example, and, and, and Natasha, let me be clear. I'm not asking you to answer for Premier Kenny at all. I'm just providing an example here. Uh, Shea says uh, to Premier Kenny yesterday, yeah, you got the NHL here uh, for, for Hub City and for the bubble, but that was months ago, right? I mean, they've, they've written about this. This interview is, is, is making press. Newspapers are writing about the radio interview. That's when you know it resonates. And Shea says to Premier, yeah. like, respectfully, uh, you're, you're, you're citing the NHL coming here as, as one of the feathers in your cap. That was months ago, and it's a drastically different scenario right now. And Alberta is among the worst performers in North America, numbers-wise, which Alberta is. And, and Jason Kenney describes it as Al, an Alberta smear, as smearing Alberta. In other words, trying to paint the talk host, Shea Ganim, as anti-Alberta. That cannot stand. I mean, that climate cannot perpetuate itself. That's unhealthy for everybody. And I think you'd probably agree with me there. I, I do, actually. I do agree with you. And um, look, the premier has been nothing but nice to me in our, our interactions when I was staff and when I was doing advocacy. Um, but he's very, very good at working with people, like very good at you know, winning over the people that he works with. Um, you know, say what you will about the premier, but he's very, very smart in terms of what he does politically. That being said, I Sometimes. think that there is, well, I mean, I mean, in terms of like, he's very well, he, he approaches everything with a, with a strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot that can be learned just from observing from like a, just a political strategy point of view. Um, that being said, I, you know, I, I do, it was something that I struggled with a lot when I was in caucus because there was this tone that I saw during the campaign of, you know, you know, we can disagree. I mean, yes, there was this attack, the attack dog style or the NDP, this, the NDP, that. Um, but at the same time, there was this, um, I guess, th there, there was one clip that Premier Kenny has had on his, uh, his social media that I saw about, you know, how it's not okay to attack Rachel Notley with these gender attacks and, and, you know, things about, you know, threatening her safety and, and whatnot. Um, and, and I thought that was, that was commendable. Uh, and, and I don't think that that sort of thing should, should fly in politics. No one should be ever threatening anyone across the aisle. Um, and I thought, you know, he was like, you know, we should be able to disagree without being disagreeable. And I was like, you know what? Yes. And, you know, bring civility back to the legislature. But yeah. when I was in caucus and I saw some of the comms, I was like, I would take a different approach to this and I would maybe do things differently. Uh, when I was in the press secretary role, we were never combative. And to this day, I, I don't really see anyone really ever being combative in that specific portfolio of community and social services um, because they don't really have the political, I guess, capital when you're dealing with a portfolio that is uh, very much focused on vulnerable populations. Yeah, you've got to um, you've got to tread you've got to tread lightly in that one. Um, very lightly. Yeah, I think I think I think we're we're seeing anyway. I'm not going to. I'm not endeavoring to put you on the spot to answer for a lot of the things that I will observe and and that I quite frankly okay, won't. I will say one thing, Ryan. It, you know, I, I have kind of I am one of those people who won't bite my tongue when it really comes down to it, and that's kind of something that's cursed me as a staffer. Um, but the one thing I will say is I have tweeted a couple times at some of the government issues managers saying, like, guys, why are you why are you saying this? Like this isn't a good tone that you're you're employing here. And I did have a couple people that were, you know, very connected in the party go into my DMs and say, You will never work in Alberta politics again. See what you I'm talking about? See what I'm talking about? I mean, th that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, right? Like shush shush, right? That's what they're saying to you. If you want to have a future, you better like that. That to me, the whole fall in line thing is 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 totally unacceptable. Um, Natasha, here's the thing: it's not just limited to this party, and and we could talk about this forever. And th the truth is, uh, the, the 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 kind of the funny thing about this show is that you have a, a bachelor of science uh, focusing on virology and immunology, and you and I were going to talk about young people observing COVID, COVID protocols, and then we started talking politics as we would if we were having a coffee or a glass of wine, and then all of a sudden now it's half hour a uh, half hour's passed and my next guest is is in the is in the bullpen ready to go and so I have to so we didn't even get to what we were supposed to talk about because because we're just shooting the breeze and sinking our teeth into something um which I love 
but it just means you're going to have to come back on the show. Some I would love to. I want to have you on a panel. We'll talk women in politics. We'll talk politics, period. We'll talk about 100 things, and I very much look forward to it. Thank you so much for giving us a part of your morning today. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm around. I'm staying home, staying safe, washing hands. I live with seniors, and if you're a young person, I get it. Everything's Everything sucks. You can't go do things. You can't socialize, um, but you can if we get things course corrected and um, we can get things back to normal sooner than later if we all just do that part. So that's the one thing I want to say to all the youngins out there telling me that things are ridiculous and we shouldn't be, you know, putting in these rules. So just please just do your part. That's hey, all I'm going to ask. <laughs> you know, it, does, it doesn't matter what your specific job description or, or your, your official title is right now. You are very clearly one with uh, leadership qualities. And uh, if more people were as politically engaged and as articulate as you, Natasha, we'd be better served. Um, really an honor to have you on the show. And thanks for making time for us. Thanks for having me. See you guys later. Yeah, you got it. That's Natasha Kornack, uh, obviously an impressive uh, person. And uh, and yeah, I see. See, now we're, we're talking about things that I have strong feelings about. Um, and, and, you know, I, I sort of run my mouth, so to speak, which isn't a bad thing. And then and, and then throw the hot potato to her. And she's like, uh, I'm not asking her to answer for the way that the government or its press secretaries are conducting themselves. And that's also not to say that I think that the official opposition is spick and span and spotless either because it's not uh and the political climate right now if whether you're looking federally uh, provincially or, or even municipally from whatever city you're you're watching there there are examples i would imagine in politics where you go what the hell is going on like what are these what are these people talking how am i better served by what's going on right now and ultimately i think that's what we endeavor to have conversations about is what do we the people expect from our elected officials we're going to roll right into this next interview i could not be more excited to have garth mullins joining us here on the show he and i are going to be collaborating on a project it's a forum that we're going to talk about coming up on december 14th garth uh before we bring him in sam uh i want to roll uh this clip i want to bring you we're going to get to garth in just a moment but he's the host of a crackdown pod Uh, this is um in my mind if not the most powerful podcast in Canada, one of them to be sure. I wanted to to tee up this interview with a portion of episode one. He's done 20 of them so far. Uh, Garth it speaks from personal experience. He is remarkably candid. I mean, you you hit play on his podcast on Crackdown Pod, and you're not hitting pause if the doorbell rings or the phone rings. You're going to hit ignore. You're going to keep on listening because it's people who use drugs in their words talking about Canada's opioid crisis. Before we get to Garth live, have a listen to this. Some people say, you know, think that's kind of a funny thing to say about withdrawal, but that's what really bothers me about withdrawal is that I delve back into that place and that person that I hated. And it comes back to the very first thing I ever said after using heroin. The very first thing I said was, I turned to my brother and I said, I feel normal. Now that's kind of an odd thing for a 12 year old (laughs) to say the first time they ever used heroin. But it's the honest to goodness truth. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, the same thing as soon when I used it when I first when I was a teenager, it's like, oh, I'm home. This is this must be what everybody else is doing all the time. Not feeling uh, apart from themselves or somehow split or at war with yourself, you know. Drugs can blot out if just for a moment the trauma of colonization, or a partner's violence, or the drudgery of work, or the terror of homelessness, or the brutality of racism. Drugs can dull the pain of injuries we got on the job. And also, drugs just feel good. That is that is uh, that is Garth Mullins, host of Crackdown Pod, who joins us now live. Uh, Garth, uh, I've long been a fan of of the work that you've been doing. I don't think I've ever heard anybody else uh, do a podcast that is so raw and so real. Welcome to Real Talk, and thanks for making time for us this morning. Uh, looks like Garth is muted. Uh, okay, Garth, right I think now. you might be so muted just gonna, right yep, now. Just, uh, oh. Okay, there oh, we go. Hey, we got there him. we go. My man, welcome and thanks Sorry, for being here. That. No, that's all good. Um, hey, Ryan, thanks. Thanks very much. Great introduction for somebody who works in radio and then has his 
mic muted. So yeah, good <laughs> yeah, one. There Thanks. you go. Thanks for having me. <laughs> there you go. Uh, the, the, the speaking of your your background in radio and, and your production history, the production value of your podcast is remarkable. It's a beautiful listen, but the content and the the voices that you platform. I mean, you I, have you have your own personal story, but the stories that you're telling by way of this um, this might be the most important podcast in the country. How did this idea come around? What got you started twenty episodes ago? I think it was in part seeing how um, the Canadian media was covering drug users. You know, there are some pretty nasty voices out there. You know, uh, some of them like uh, Rick Bell and Tristan Hopper and people like that from Alberta, you know. So uh, we just thought maybe we should try and tell our own stories if we don't like how other people are describing us. You know, I'd worked in uh, drug user activism, you know, advocacy circles where people were, you know, trying to improve the safety for themselves and their community to reduce the risks. And I just thought, uh, nobody's seeing this. Nobody's seeing people who are, who are using drugs every day and really struggling around uh, lots of issues, but also trying to contribute positively to their own lives and to, and to their community's lives. So I guess we wanted to show that. Uh, you, you referenced Tristan Hopper. He was actually on this show yesterday, and I'm pretty sure you're talking about, I think I think it was uh, last year maybe when he was still living in Edmonton, maybe two years ago, talking about uh, supervised consumption services that were opening, and, and he, he went on a Twitter thread. He actually came on my previous radio show right after that, and, and we had a bit of a dust-up, and actually I wish the interview content hadn't been wiped uh, from the internet forever when I was sent packing because there was some value to it. But basically he was alluding to the fact that he said he was uh, finding syringes uh, in and around his his property. He had a little he had a daughter out there. He was alleging that crime statistics were increasing uh, since that supervised consumption service opened, which which actually ran counter to the narrative of the president of that uh, community league that had actually said in, in cooperation with the Edmonton police service, they had noted that crime statistics had actually in the Boyle street Macaulay area of Edmonton had actually dropped, uh, since the SCS, uh, opened, um, the, the media, I think, generally speaking, you know, my brother works at Inside in Vancouver. He was on here on the show last week and he talked about the J word, the J word that people use to describe people who use drugs and how much that grates on him and how much that impacts him. The public dialogue around people who use drugs, I think, is, is based, number one, on, on, on people's naive nature and number two, just on preconceived notions. People are afraid of that scene. People are afraid of their fellow human beings, aren't they? Yeah, probably, you know, and I, I hear it all the time too, you know, junkie is the word, I guess. And, um, it's, it's, you know, words have uh, a lot of power and I guess that's what we're, we're using right now to communicate, but they kind of contain a lot of political ideas too. So this doesn't come from nowhere. It's the fact that, um, hard drugs are illegal in Canada and have been for 110 years, but we also had alcohol was illegal in Canada too, for a time, you know? I think about the history of alcohol prohibition where, you know, after people got off work, they just want to have a beer and then that became illegal. And so it's hard to smuggle around beer. It's like a large volume. And so the alcohol kind of got to be moonshine, which is a lot stronger and smaller and easier to smuggle. And then it was unregulated. People went blind, got sick. Some people died. It all sounds very familiar uh, over my lifetime. You know, um, there's been uh, two overdose crises. The heroin has gotten stronger and stronger. Back 100, 110 years ago, people would smoke opium instead of shooting heroin. So uh, it's the laws that are kind of driving this market to be stronger. And it's the laws that are making criminals of lots of people who maybe just want to do a rail of coke, you know, on the weekend. I mean, BC is like is like Alberta. We've got a big resource sector. I mean, I used to work in mining and it's, you know, you work 12 hour days and a lot of people are working underground, don't see the sun for a long time. They just want to kind of party, you know, and um, if that's going to kill them, then because of the laws, because of the fact that it's illegal, uh, then we got a government problem, but it's also a government problem that's making people um, appear to be these, these terrible other people, like a different category of people, not someone you know, but really drug users are somebody in your workplace or your community or your church or whatever, you know, we're, we're everywhere. Well, there's so Garth, there are there are two drug users in this conversation. Um, it, it was not lost on me mm-hmm. uh, last night. I'm, I, I, I put my dog on the leash 
and I go out for a walk and we're making our way through the neighborhood and I, and I fire up a joint and I'm smoking a joint and I'm listening to your podcast and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, boy, is Garth ever courageous uh, to talk about his personal drug use and his personal drug journey and to bring people on to have frank and open and biting conversations as I'm puffing on this joint and then it kind of hit me. You know, it kind of hit me in that moment, and I thought, well, am I going to share this story tomorrow, that here I am using drugs that were illicit up to two years ago in Canada, but nobody's, I mean, it's legal now. I don't care. Why can't I go on? Why can't I? It's legal, right? What's the difference between me drinking a Strongbow cider and smoking a joint? There's zero difference. So as a society, we sit here and we say, well, a glass of wine isn't bad. We can joke about that and, and put, you know, mommy juice on the glass. And we all joke about that. Right. And then and then, oh, my, you know, my, my dad came in smelling like weed. My dad's smoking weed in the garage and everybody snickers. But then if it turns into Uncle Garth, right, is, is shooting up or something, uh, then all of a sudden it's like, ooh, mm-hmm. right. Can we, we, we structure it, don't we? For sure. And I, th- I think people will be thinking, oh, a heroin through a needle is a lot worse. And, and it, is, it, is, it is different, right? But if you think about the, our alcohol prohibition example, um, you know, beer was what, what the most popular drink before prohibition. And then when they ended prohibition, it was the most popular drink again. So I'll bet you after eventually the drug war is over, we come to some kind of uh, proper solution on this that people would be able to just smoke opium again you know once the police are out of the mix and all the chasing people around and stuff I, I think that the calmness you could see a different world emerge you know uh garth i have so much ground that i want to cover with you uh a lot of people uh right now are submitting questions for you which i'd like to honor uh you know their attendance here as audience members and and get to uh, you know some of the things that they'd like to to cover i know that you're obviously keenly aware of drug policy and the politics around this i mean on crackdown pod you talk about everything from government policy to drug enforcement policing uh, and i want to get into how people are trying to shut you down right now because that resonates with me uh, very strongly but there are some pointed and specific specific questions uh, about your take on what Alberta's doing right now uh, to address this opioid crisis. It's been somewhat of a dramatic uh, turn in focus with a change in government uh, where supervised consumption services uh, in Edmonton and, and, and Lethbridge and Calgary and a planned one in Red Deer and others are seeing funding pulled while the government is pointing out that it's investing more in addictions treatment centers. Do you feel strongly about how BC, uh, your home province or, or Alberta or any other province are uh, addressing Canada's opioid crisis? And would you say that any government right now is taking it seriously enough, considering how many people are dying? No, no, no government's taking it seriously enough. And there's lots to criticize out here in British Columbia, too. So I'm not I'm not finger wagging at all. But you know, my my own personal story, I've I used heroin for a lot of my life. I'm on methadone now, but um I went to a lot of NA and 12 step meetings, you know, I, I did try the uh, Alberta model or the recovery route and uh, it didn't, didn't work out for me. It didn't stick. Um, and I spent a lot of years trying to do that. And it's true. It doesn't work for everybody. In, in fact, I, I think probably it doesn't work for most people. Um, and they told me at those meetings uh, again and again, you know, keep coming back. Like uh, if you, if you relapse, they, they say that, um, substance use disorder is a chronic and relapsing condition. They say, if you relapse, it's okay. You come back and, you know, you start counting your, your clean time again, and you get a little, a key fob for, for every, you know, day and week and month and year that you are, you are clean and sober. And so I mostly got the white one, <laughs> which was like the, just, just for today, like you were, <laughs> you showed up to a meeting good for you. Yeah. And that's, you know, they do say that's the most important one. But when I, when I was mostly going to those meetings, the, um, the drugs were, we're dangerous. People are overdosing, but just not in the numbers now. And so we can't build a system that relies on people keeping coming back, that relies on oh, over 10 years, you might get there because people will be dead by then. Uh, so we, we need to build a system that includes and puts harm reduction at the front because all the big dreams about people never using drugs and all that, that's very Nancy Reagan. And I don't know, people can believe that, but it's, it's turned out to be kind of a pipe dream. But it's a dream we can't afford anymore. We have to grow up and say, look, people are going to be using drugs. You know, uh, we all work in hard jobs and kind of want to get a little bit of relief from that. Sometimes we get injured at work and uh, we got to make it so the drugs don't kill us. The number one, 
metric of success of any approach to drugs is, is everyone dying? <laughs> you know, is nobody dying anymore? Like, uh, this is still a problem in BC, but it's a, it's a big problem in Alberta. You guys are going to catch up and overtake us if uh, you don't build out harm reduction and, uh, and harm reduction is still is first aid, right? Like, so if you think about it, um, offering no first aid at all is, is, is the worst. Offering some first aid and harm reduction is better, but giving a hospital and having surgery and having the whole, to extend this metaphor, having a whole suite of uh, options is, is a lot better. And the thing that's killing people is a contaminated drug supply. And the thing that'll stop killing people is to have that drug supply replaced with the stuff at the pharmacy. So if you're a daily opioid user like me, that you would get uh, diacetyl morphine from the pharmacy instead of fentanyl or, or heroin off the street, and the overdose rates would drop. You would also see organized crime no longer have a market. Like people like me wouldn't have to score off of a, a drug dealer anymore. And then you would be able to see all kinds of those things that, um, you know, Tristan Hopper was saying in his neighborhood were bothering him uh, start to disappear. You know, uh, so the direction Alberta is going is deeply ideological too. You know, Jason Kenney was in Stephen Harper's government. Stephen Harper was trying to stop Insight, the, the first safe injection site in North America here in Vancouver, where your brother works, stop that from opening in court. Uh, Harper and his cabinet failed to do that. They tried to stop a, um, you know, prescription heroin pilot project here, which has been incredibly successful, and they failed to stop that too. But what they did do is they stalled progress on harm reduction for 10 years or so in this country. So the build out of that kind of infrastructure that we're struggling to build now could have actually happened before the overdose crisis. So, you know, I mean, to that, to that degree, uh, Jason Kenney and his cabinet and Harper and his cabinet have the blood of my, my friends and your friend, probably everyone's friends on their hands. We're talking to Garth Mullins, uh, the host, the producer, the founder of uh, Crackdown Pod. Uh, more with Garth in just a second. Uh, wanted to pay a couple of bills here and let you know how grateful we are for the support of the team at Local Waste Services. Uh, they're not just waste collection, by the way, and this is something we want to make sure you know about. There's a, there are a myriad of ways, and they can lay this out for you in a phone call. They want you to call them directly. They're local, after all. Uh, to recycle and reduce your waste, just give local waste a call. They've been in the business for 25 years here, employing local people and creating opportunities, quite frankly, for local entrepreneurs as well. There are expansion opportunities. Uh, give Chris or Lauren Labossier a call today at 780-242-9746. They'd love to talk trash with you. We'll be bringing back Trash Talk Friday right around 10 o'clock tomorrow. If you have a gripe to get off your chest, shoot us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Trash Talk presented every Friday by the team at local waste and it's not too late in fact there's still plenty of time to give your local grocer at Friesen brothers a call 14 locations across alberta soon to open their 15th in south edmonton they employ a team of talented red seal chefs if you want to take a break this holiday season you're not in the mood to do a big turkey maybe you don't need a big turkey because the whole family's not coming over this year it's a unique year give their team of red seal chefs the green light and they'll have you covered for your holiday feast so you can spend your time investing uh, in your family relationships. Friesen Brothers is Alberta grown and Alberta owned. Garth Mullins is our guest host of Crackdown Pod. You have to download this podcast. You have to listen to this podcast. You know, we talked to Liberal MP Nathaniel Erskine Smith, Garth, who, who said the exact same thing that you say. He acknowledged that safe supply and that the, a move or an initiative or even public and, and, and national conversation around decriminalizing or legalizing all drugs would require great political courage. For that reason, considering the fact that the thing most politicians are, are most concerned about is their own job security, can you see that ever actually happening? Oh, sure. Um, we're, we're, we're in a time of great political cowardice, <laughs> you know, in, in British Columbia, in Alberta, in Canada. And so uh, the ideas and the, and the fortitude inside of those politicians will not win it. But if um, we can organize ourselves enough uh, as drug users and families and, and people who care, um, then, then we'll be able to twist their arms. And I think this is how history works. Is like you don't get things because the government's going to be nice and hand them out. You get things because you organize and you arm twist and you get the government to reform something. 
I think everybody who's ever gone to work at, in a trade union knows this, you know, you got to go on strike and fight for better wages. I mean, it's why we have the eight hour day and the weekend, be, not because the government was nice and thought, oh man, people can't be working all the time. It's because people went on strike for that stuff and, uh, you know, organized themselves and we're no different. We have to do the same, the same sort of things, you know, uh, people who use drugs got to organize better. And, uh, that's, that's kind of on me and, and the people I know and the people around the podcast, it's part of why we made the podcast. I, you have a, I mean, you're, you're just doing it right. I don't typically intend to bring a guest on and just gosh, like this Garth, but I really believe in <laughs> Feel what you're doing. <laughs> but but you you're doing it right. You know, you have you have an editorial board, you have a science advisor, you 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 have a Patreon of uh, of this sort of nation of supporters that are funding some of the investigative journalism that you're doing, as you described it, the real detective shit. Uh you know, you're 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 doing it properly, but still uh, as episode 20 details, and I, and I encourage people to listen to it, people are trying to silence you. People are trying to shut you down. They don't like what you're saying because you're making them uncomfortable. What does that do? Uh, does, does that fill your tank more than anything? Um, it wastes my time, honestly. Yeah. Uh, you know, like we, there have been, um, I think, about a half dozen groups or individuals um, from around uh, where we live here, who are you not know, just random people who are out there being keyboard warriors, but people who are, you know, connected and have some resources and power in the city who have tried to shut us down. But, um, you know, we get our funding from a lot of places and we get academic grants and we got a lot of good um, committed Patreon supporters. And so it's not it's not that easy. Uh, but yeah, it's it just kind of wastes our time, you know, because you got to respond and figure out what's going on and everything like that. Um but I, I guess it's also a sign that you're doing something right. You know, if, if nobody was listening and nobody cared, then I guess nobody would want to shut us up. Yeah, no kidding. And well said, uh, Garth, you're, you're, uh, <laughs> I guess you feel, you feel those feelings too, do you? Well, I do. And, and, but you know what I mean? I, and, mm. and I don't want to make this about me. Um, um, do you, do you have to go at 10 or can we, can we go into the 10 o'clock hour a little bit? Can we spend some extra time talking here? Uh, I, I got a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll take a few minutes. But so I don't want to spend it talking about me, but I guess all, all I can say is that, uh, the people are speaking with crackdown pod and the people have spoken with real talk and our show wouldn't be where it is without our uh, sponsors support and without the support of our Patreon, uh, who quite frankly, uh, you know, the Patreon supporters are going to allow us to hire more people and, and, and expand our voice. And, and I think the reality is with technology now and with podcasts and with these platforms, uh, it's harder to shut people up and it's harder to shut people down because political and corporate powers have less power now that people have more avenues for expression. And I just think whether we're talking about drug policy in Canada or whether we're talking about political conversation, that's a remarkably empowering and encouraging thing when it would be otherwise pretty discouraging. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about, yeah, I, I think so too. I hope so. This, this event, I, I'm, I'm, very much looking forward to this serious subject matter. Um, the other epidemic, it's a panel discussion coming up. You're going to be taking part. I'm very proud to be moderating it on Monday evening. That's December 14th at 6.30, and people can simply look for the other epidemic on Eventbrite, or you can check out my Twitter profile. I've, I've pushed it out. You're going to be one of the speakers, Garth, as the Alberta Businesses for Evidence-Based Policy pursue discussion on how businesses – can help save lives. What role do you think the private sector, entrepreneurs, businesses can have in the context of this discussion? You know, I uh, I, I have not really um, got the same experience as people who are in the business community. So I, I won't um, you know, deign to tell them, but I can tell them a little bit about my experience as a drug user, the times when I probably have been... Um, maybe one of the people that the, the local business person wants to move along. But I can also tell you that when we all work together, the, the drug users around the Vancouver area network of drug users, a little group, a little union we have, um, we want to be good neighbors, right? We want to be able to have lives where we have the resources and the capacity to be good neighbors, not where people are pushed so to the margins, so to the edge of existence, sort of the edge of death that, um, that you start to lose grip of that sort of thing. And I think um, a harm reduction is a good way to do that. Now, a safe injection site, for example, it's not going to make crime worse, but it's not going to solve all the social problems in the neighborhood either. 
but it can do one thing. It can keep people alive and it can reduce the amount of people who are using drugs in the park. And it can also uh, run a needle program outside of it where people are picking up the, the um, needle debris that may be left around. And I think where I've seen it work, like in Vancouver, where there are relationships with the local business improvement association and, and, you know, some business people, I've seen really good partnerships come out of that and really uh, healthy relationships and building that kind of uh, connection between the two communities can have really good results where if people feel safe and not attacked to talk to each other and say, Hey, look, this is a problem. Like my, the people can't park to come and get their coffee or whatever. Uh, then it's like, we've been able to defuse those little things. So I just wanted to share my experience with people that there is a much better way to come at this problem than the sort of uh, a tirade uh, columns or, or worse having yourself as a business person, be the pawn of some politician that just wants to uh, keep getting elected and thumping their chest, you know? Well, that's, and that's part of it. Oh, like, this is a, this is a very Vancouver sound that might be coming through the mic here. It's a siren just pulling up. It's, um, it, it's wonderful. So, actually, uh, quite frankly, I mean, it's not wonderful that somebody's requiring emergency assistance, but, but to me, it's a, you use sound in your storytelling uh, like not a lot of podcasters do. Obviously, you have a lot of experience in radio production, but but the sound of a siren. Um, as a matter of fact, that clip that we rolled right at the beginning of your interview, prior to the, about thirty seconds before in the podcast, uh, the individual I think it, is is it is it Dave or Dan, whoever you were talking to there. I can't remember his name. I apologize, Dean. Dean. Um, he he. There's a siren in the background when you're talking to him, and he describes how that. I don't know if he uses the word trigger, but he describes how that sound takes him back to a certain place and i thought it was such a powerful moment garth that's what that sound of that siren did to him mm -hmm. well a lot of us around the podcast are musicians like i am i've played in crappy bands um in in fact i've, I've played in uh, uh calgary and, uh, and and edmonton a few times and um you kind of because you have to do it all yourself you learn to troubleshoot the pa and fix the monitor and fix the guitar and figure out the mic and all that. So it sort of prepares you for, and of course you get lots of hecklers too in a bar. And so it prepares you for being a podcaster, I guess. Yeah, there you go. By the way, Scott Harris is, is watching the show today. Uh, he's watching it live streaming on YouTube and he wants to give you a shout out bonus points. He says for rocking the operation Ivy t-shirt, but, but you're all punk rock pal. I mean, that's, you know, you probably have 150 pretty <laughs> sweet t-shirts, eh? Yeah. Black T-shirt for every day of the year. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, Garth, we also, I wanted to read this. This is a great note from Sarah, uh, who's listening in. We're getting some great conversation on, on Twitter right now in our hashtag RealTalkRJ. Sarah says, uh, just re really want to thank Garth for having this honest conversation about drug use. Sarah says, I read the book Chasing the Scream a few years ago, and it completely changed, she says, my understanding of drug use and how it should be legalized or at the very least decriminalized uh, let me ask you if you draw a, a line between decriminalization or, or legalization i suspect you're going to argue that drugs should be legalized but i don't want to assume uh, where do you stand on that that nuanced position i think both is good you know um decriminalization is just stop the police from chasing around people who use drugs i think that's really good going to jail i can tell you firsthand is not a useful experience in any way it's not good for society it's not good for the person i mean Certainly, there are some super dangerous people that you don't want just hanging around your neighborhood. But for just using drugs and being involved in drugs, that's why a lot of people in North America go to jail. And those people are over proportionally overrepresented indigenous black people of color. Uh, so, yeah, like decriminalization just means the police stand down. They just stop stop being involved in this sort of thing. Legalization means that the the drugs that people are doing are regulated in some way and there's lots of different models but um you know that they're that you're doing a pharmaceutical instead of something that's made uh, on the street or in someone's bedroom or something like that you know so the regulation and that sort of uh more certainty over what's in it so i think the both of them together no cops and safe drugs uh allows us to stop the massive dying that's happening right now. Garth, in closing, uh, and if you're just tuning in, if, if you're listening to us via our live streaming audio on Mixler and you're wondering who this is, this is Garth Mullins. He's the host of Crackdown Pod, uh, a, a courageous and, and very powerful 
pod uh, that you can find anywhere you download your podcasts. Um, I wanted to ask you about Safe Supply. Uh, just to clarify, to help the, I, I think that so many people are, are open minded. Obviously, people want these overdose, these preventable deaths to stop. These are preventable deaths, but they don't maybe necessarily know what a safe supply would look like. And I think people are picturing, you know, little packets of heroin or crack, uh, you know, beside the halls and the Mentos at 7-Eleven. What would uh, an effective um, and reputable rollout of safe supply look like if you were developing the policy? You know, I think um, I would want to get communities together to talk about that because right now you don't see vodka beside the halls at right. the at the drugstore and and even buying smokes. And I know I'm trying very hard not to be a smoker anymore. Um, you don't, can't get them everywhere, you know, and you can't get them if you're if you're uh, young, you know, under 19 or whatever. So, uh, like, there are already substances that are are regulated, you know, that are legal and controlled, but also the access to them is regulated and you can, you can make them easier or harder to get. You know, there are rules around where, at least in Vancouver, where cannabis stores uh, uh, can be cited. So there are ways to decide how to do it. And, and I, and I see in our society, you know, alcohol is, is uh, very profitable and is very promoted. And um, as someone was saying on a panel, I was on the other day, uh, it's like, you're almost shamed if you don't drink. So um, we don't need to flip it all the way around to that, where some of the biggest companies in the country are involved in promoting the use of a substance. You know, we don't need to let it be like a free market Wild West time, um, uh, like in that way. There are middle grounds. There's, there's ways we can choose. I think the most important thing is that people can find access to it. You know, half the people who are dying out here are not people like me who use uh, opioids every day. Uh, they're they're like the weekend warrior type people, right? People who just and not just people who are using opioids, but who are just trying to uh, you know do a couple lines of coke or something, and that's become contaminated. So something where those people could access it, as well as the the someone who's wired, like who's the everyday kind of person. Um, I think that's what you got to get to if if we want to be serious about uh, stopping the deaths, and and that's going to require you know, a proper complicated discussion. But the very first thing is like the willingness to do this thing, the willingness to take the handcuffs off and to take the rules off um, so that people can survive. Garth Mullins, uh, a remarkable human being, is the founder, the executive producer, and the host of Crackdown Pod. And I encourage you to follow them on Twitter. And more importantly, to subscribe, uh, listen to, rate, and review his podcast. And if you want to hear more about what Garth has to say about this, as, as well as the other talented panelists, The Other Epidemic, a panel discussion. I'm proud to moderate it on Monday, December 14th. You can find it on Eventbrite or just check out my Twitter profile page garth this has been a real honor i've looked forward to this conversation for a long time and i look forward to connecting again thanks for giving us your time on this thursday morning oh me too thanks for doing the show and i love the independent courageous spirit of this thing even after all the drama that came before uh good on you man and uh thanks for hosting uh or sharing our thing on monday and we'll see you there you got it man thank you very much that's garth mullins appreciate that uh victoria is listening in <laughs> Um, I want to ask Sam Brooks what he makes of this in just a second, because your posture just you just went, whoa, you went, whoa, actually, let's just uh, pat yourself in, pal. The, the senior producer of this show. Uh, have you ever have you heard Crackdown Pod before? Have you heard from Garth? I, I'm before? one episode in when you when you told me, oops, I, I have myself in the preview, but not on the program. There we go. Uh, when we when you told me that we were interviewing Garth yesterday, I, I subscribed immediately. I'm one episode in. It's 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 heavy. It's powerful. It's, it's very, real. Very. Heavy. Um, the production value is off the charts. So I mean, good. it's it's like listening to Radio Lab. Uh, it's you know, I I just it's yeah. I I look forward to, I look forward to listening to and crying over the rest of the yeah. episodes. You know what I mean? Because it's it, it affects you. I actually um I have a takeaway if you if you don't mind me telling a personal story. I don't mind you telling a personal so, story. You talked about and and this is uh not a parallel to drug use, but it's it's definitely um we talked about like does private business have do do local businesses have a place in this and and you know the first thing i can think of is the biggest thing that local business can do is remove the stigma treat people who use drugs as humans and 
what I immediately actually thought of was my dad's parents, my grandparents who are, who are now deceased. But, uh, you know, they, they were never a rich family and they lived in the Macaulay neighborhood and they ran a diner there. And uh, they gave away a lot of free meals. A lot of people experiencing homelessness would come into their diner. My grandpa would serve anybody that sat down. And I remember asking him about it years later and, and just saying, you know, what, what was that like? And he says, well, we got paid back sometimes. And he says, but, you know, people were hungry. We gave them food. It was, it was such a non-issue for him. And, and just, you know, parallel to people that are using drugs, people experiencing homelessness, they, they need a warm meal. They need a business to treat them with dignity. Yeah. And I think that just giving a person their dignity back can make a world of difference. You know, I, I remember talking to a, a friend who, who he no longer works there, but, but worked at a business downtown. And, and I would assume that they have kept this there as like a, a Narcan kit, like an naloxone kit. Um, this is a design firm in Edmonton. Uh, they're, they're not on the front lines of, well, I mean, I guess they are on the front lines of, of the opioid crisis because we all are. Uh, we all are on the front lines. Uh, but, but the one thing they thought, well, what can we do as a business? What can we do as a, as a citizen of downtown? And, and the immediate thing that they knew they could do is have a naloxone kit uh, at their business and readily accessible at the reception desk and train uh, or, or, or at least pursue education for their staff that if somebody did uh, overdose, they're downtown, uh, if somebody did overdose, that they'd be able to use it and, and revive this person until emergency personnel could, could arrive. And, and, and there are little things that each of us can do. I know that some of you, uh, th th you know, would, would keep a, a Narcan kit with you at all times. Others of you have probably gone out of your way, to, for example, to read uh, more about this. I mean, I, I'm reading our comments here. You know, Carol says, yeah, what Sarah said, she says, chasing the scream uh, should be required reading for everybody. Right. Uh, Judy says, you know, people who use drugs are no different than than people who drink alcohol. I mean, let's be honest. That's the same thing. Alcohol is a drug. I mean, geez, I've got a coffee going right now. That's a drug. Now you're going to roll your eyes and say, are you putting coffee and heroin on the same level? Well, you know, we're talking about stimulants. We're talking about things that are outside of our natural biochemistry that we introduce to make us feel a certain way. So it's maybe not heroin's not your flavor. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that everybody go out and try heroin at 12 years old like the individual that we heard in that portion that we played from Crackdown Pod, but people's lives are different. I mean, I thought it was so powerful when Garth, you heard Garth's voice at the beginning. He said drugs are a, a remarkable way to temporarily forget about things like colonialism or sexual abuse or domestic violence. And oh, and by the way, they feel good. You know, for somebody that's grown up in a situation not as privileged as mine or maybe yours, how do we judge their journey? How do we apply our sense of morality or our sense of what we believe to be acceptable or unacceptable or tacky or gauche or appropriate to someone else? Uh, quite frankly, that's that's really not our role, is it? And it's not appropriate at all. Um, it, it's a very powerful conversation to have. And and we want to make sure that we have conversations like this on Real Talk. I mean, I appreciate this tweet from Victoria using our Hashtag Victoria says, you know, it's a small act, uh, but by talking about his use of weed, Ryan Jesperson is doing his part to destigmatize cannabis. Well, I hope so. I mean, I mean, if, if you follow me on Instagram, by the way, on my Insta story, I, every day I push out the guests that are going to come on the show. I encourage you to follow me. Plus, you get some insight into my life outside of the radio studio. But you'll find a few posts ago. I'm, I'm holding up two massive bags of weed and we're in the business of weed. I disclose that to you. I'm excited about it, quite frankly. Uh, Joy Botanicals, I'm a part owner of that. My brother's the grow master, Jonas. He'll be on the show sometime talking about cannabis. I believe that a stigma around cannabis is disappearing, but I think it's still there. Uh, Jeffrey Hansen Carlson, a uh, prominent Edmontonian, responded to Victoria, and he said, you know, a few years ago I was on Ryan's show, and he asked me if I would judge people if they used cannabis. Jeffrey, I remember asking you the question and kind of smirking to myself while you answered. Jeffrey says, I gave an honest answer at the time. Yes, I would. I would judge people if they used cannabis. He says, since then, I've really come to enjoy the odd piece of chocolate. So Jeffrey's discovered edibles. Victoria responds to him. Look at the conversations that this show is spurring. She says, I used to be the same way. She says, I thought that drug users, including those using cannabis, were all losers. Victoria says, I'm so glad I educated myself and opened my mind. She says there are some great chocolates out there for sure. That from Victoria. So we can do our part. And, and this is not just around people who use drugs or conversations around the opioid crisis. But this show and this community that gathers each and every morning uh, can go a long way in destigmatizing a lot of things.
and ensuring that we can have courageous conversations. And sometimes our conversations will be uncomfortable. I'm sure that some of you, the, the minute that you heard what Garth Mullins and I were talking about, you clicked off the show for today. And that's fine. You're on your own personal journey. For some others, it'll be discomfort around politics. I think you could tell that Garth didn't love that I had Tristan Hopper on the show yesterday. You know, we were going to have Pierre Polyev on the show today, and some of you, when I announced it yesterday, uh, and, and unfortunately, Pierre Polyev had to send his regrets. The interview was supposed to be right now, so if you're tuning in right now wondering where he is, uh, his staff, uh, unfortunately, this morning, just before the show, let us know that he'll have to reschedule. So we'll try to get him back next week. But some of you reached out to me yesterday after our conversation with Christian Freeland, and, and I said, we'll get the other side of the coin with Pierre Polyev today. And some of you said, I'm disappointed in you having him on. You know, I'm disappointed in how he's spinning the, the Great Reset, and I'm, and I'm disappointed that you would give him a platform, right? I saw criticism from Alberta Liberal Party leader David Kahn in the first week of this show that was disappointed that I was having certain voices. He didn't like that I was having MLA Drew Barnes on the show from the United Conservative Party. David and Drew probably don't agree on anything. As a matter of fact, I don't know if there's one thing they would agree on. I don't know. Uh, maybe the fact that both of them are listening to this show, that's a good start. And I said to David, if you believe or if your impression, uh, and this is, I say respectfully, was that we're going to do a show that will only feature guests, that, that will only feature interviews with people uh, with whom I find common ground or agree with, uh, that sounds to me like the, the most boring show, and I would never try to sell a show like that called Real Talk if it's only going to have guests that I agree with or guests that we see eye to eye with. Nobody I think wants to listen to nobody that. Nobody wants to. Well, some people do. There are there there are some shows where you can you can safely they they promise they won't challenge you. Right, you can tune in every single day, and and you'll have your views reiterated and recycled and regurgitated, and you never have to step outside of your bubble. And if that's your flavor, that's fine. I mean, I'm not talking to those folks because those folks probably aren't watching this show. This is a show for people that aren't afraid to challenge preconceived notions, for people that aren't afraid to shake the cage, so to speak. We want to put some numbers on something very striking. Numbers on something completely different, something to do with COVID nineteen in just a moment. But first, I want to get to mentioning a couple more of the the groups that have done incredible work in ensuring that we are coming to you, bringing you these conversations each and every day. And that includes our tech team at Westworld Computers. I've got a MacBook Pro and I've got an iMac in front of me, or rather I've got an iPad in front of me. Sam's got the iMac. And also it gives us a chance to use our sweet GoPro shot every single day. So you can see Sam's setup there. Uh, we are powered by Westworld Computers. And for more than 40 years, that Western Canadian family-owned business has been powering individuals and, well, creatives and others uh, as people look for everything from iPhones all the way through to the big desktop units. Daryl and his team, they want your business. Don't go to that big store with the big Apple on it. You know the one I'm talking about in the mall. Check out Westworld Computers. They're independent. They've been in the game, as mentioned, for more than 40 years, and they're a proud partner of Real Talk here, uh, as is the team at Dairy Queens in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. You know, so many of you are talking to us about this 30 seconds of the show where I start talking about Dairy Queen and what it does to you. I know that some of you right now are all of a sudden going, I'm changing up my day. I'm changing up my plan. I'm hitting the drive through today at a Dairy Queen in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, and Baseline Road. Why is that important? Well, not just because you get to chow down on Dairy Queen, my friends. You're also supporting local businesses and a huge support to local charities. In fact, tomorrow, I'm going to run some numbers past you with their permission of what they're plugging back into their community. These are the local movers and shakers at Dairy Queen keeping this broadcast on the air every morning, and we're grateful for their support. Uh, Sam, I sent you that graphic, that tweet. You know the one I'm talking about. Can, can you put this up on the screen? This, to me, this hit me uh, like a ton of bricks. Look at this. These are the deadliest days in American history. As we take a look at the pandemic and the spread, and you know, we spend a lot of time talking about Alberta, Western Canada. We've talked a lot about Manitoba, and then, of course, the numbers nationwide. But look at this. For those of you that are just streaming the audio, I'll get into this for you. The deadliest day in American history, 8,000 lives lost uh, to the Galveston hurricane. The second was a civil war battle, uh, Antietam, 3,600 lives lost. I'm just, I'm, I'm saying this like so cavalier. I'm saying this is, oh, 3,600 lives, 3,600 
The third deadliest day in American history was 9-11, September 11th of 2001, where nearly 3,000 people lost their lives, 2,977 lives lost. I'd be curious to know, by the way, Sam, if that includes uh, first responders, uh, police officers, firefighters, paramedics that are continuing. Uh, I mean, we're seeing people pass from cancers. Yeah, I, I'm... I'm... I don't I, think it would. I don't be, think it would be. Incl- I think that's literally people that died in the towers. I think that would be people that yeah. died in the towers, firefighters included. But but I'd be curious to know what that number is going to look like in ten years. Well, I mean, look at uh, John Stewart is doing a ton of advocacy Amazing for veterans work. of nine eleven, right? Amazing and, and like work. It, you know, everybody's kind of forgetting about them after the fact. No kidding. So that number there, twenty nine hundred seventy seven lives lost on that day. Now look at this. Okay, the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh deadliest days in American history. Bumping Pearl Harbor down to number eight are in order last Thursday, last Wednesday, last Tuesday, and last Friday, where cumulatively more than 10,000 American lives were lost to COVID-19. That with that graphic request where I said, hey, Sam, I want to show this on the show. Uh, I want to put this up in front of our, our viewing audience did that hit you like it hit me? I mean, when you start stacking it up against Pearl Harbor, the Civil War, the Galveston Hurricane, wow. I think it's more proof that people are dying in silence. You know, um, Pearl Harbor and 9-11, uh, these, are, these are attacks that were concentrated in one place, even the Civil War battle that we were talking about. Um when our deaths are distributed across a country in hospitals and, and clinics and long-term care centers and, frankly, houses, people are dying at home, um, it's easy to tune out. There isn't, you know, there isn't a, a, a headline-leading camera shot of the explosion of the battle of the, you know what I mean? So it's, him, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's one of those things where I really think that it's just, it's more proof that... This pandemic's a bit of a sleeper sometimes. That's a good way to put it. I thought that Jacqueline Robinson, that was a really powerful interview that we had with her uh, earlier this week, the public health nurse out of Vancouver, a personal friend of mine that, that, uh, that survived COVID-19, uh, literally you know, in a coma, on a ventilator, you know, a wheelchair out of the hospital type thing, you know, couldn't walk the stairs up into her own home, couldn't walk to the end of the block. This is like a fit uh, you know, 40 year old marathon runner. Uh, and, and she described it. So she's seen COVID. She's seen the beast within. She's fought it and won. Uh, but she also sees it as a nurse. And she talked about the impact that it's having on public health professionals, the doctors and nurses that she works with. And she said, she talked about the impact. If you haven't watched the interview, you have to watch the interview. You can find it on our uh, YouTube channel. And of course, you can download the podcast. Just subscribe to our podcast. It'll download on your phone automatically. But she talked about people that are dying with their phones to their ears. The families can't be with them. There's sometimes there's a, what she called, I think a compassionate visit where one person can, can sit beside the, the patient. Uh, but these are people and, and it, and it just breaks my heart. And, if, and I know it breaks yours too. If you have a heartbeat, it'll break your heart to think about people that are dying with their phones to their ears. And you think of who's on the other side of that call, Right probably a conference call in some circumstances in some circumstances a very intimate call between two people a son or a daughter a spouse uh, potentially somebody losing their life partner of 40 or 50 or 60 years over the phone until they hear that last breath or, or don't hear anything at all I mean it's just a clear picture of why we need to take this so seriously why we need to take this deadly seriously. Tomorrow's show I'm very much looking forward to this Dr. Peter Silverstone is a psychiatrist in Edmonton and he's talking about, uh, not, not the music yet, Sammy, because I still got some business to take care of. Thanks. Um, but Dr. Peter Silverstone and David Staples, did you see this? The columnist for the Edmonton Journal. They got in a bit of a dust up yesterday on Twitter talking about COVID measures and protocols and mental health. And well, we thought that it might make for a good radio segment. So tomorrow on Real Talk, David Staples and Dr. Peter Silverstone are going to go head to head right out of the gates at 830. And then a panel on meeting in the middle, on constructive and respectful dialogue. We know it can exist because we're doing it here. And you're doing your part. We see it on our YouTube comments. People, for the most part, respectfully corresponding and challenging one another. And it lets us know that what we're doing here, what our vision is, what our goal is, it's working. And that's because of you, our Real Talk 
Rock audience. One final shout out to the team at Clean Air Club. We're so grateful that they're giving us the confidence that as we continue to bring you this show, we're doing it in a room, we're doing it in a workspace that has air that's properly circulated, properly ventilated, and the team at Clean Air Club wants to remind you that if you want that same confidence in your own home, You've got to pay close attention to your furnace filters. That's the business that they're in. And by the way, we're loving the emails from some of you that are writing in simply to say, I signed up at cleanairclub.ca. Well, you know you're going to be breathing easier this holiday season. All you need to do, you go down to your furnace, you check your filter, you let the team know the size. They're going to help you with your frequency. They're even going to drop them off. They're delivering the furnace filters for you so you can take that off your to-do list. And they're big supporters of local businesses, so they include a small gift a meaningful gift from another local entrepreneur with every delivery check out cleanairclub.ca or you can link to them under the sponsors page at ryanjesperson.com sam another bang up job today in the midst of technical challenges all we can do is keep it real and we know that you're into that it means a lot to us that you subscribe to our podcast that you subscribe to our youtube channel and ring the bell it was important yesterday because you were notified of an outside the time zone exclusive with christia freeland if you missed that that it's on our page. We'll talk to you tomorrow at 8.30 Mountain Time.